dystopian Burlington, Vermont, or Little San Francisco on Lake Champlain. Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. This week, we're going to be seeing several examples of very bad behavior by black people from the lowest to the highest levels. And I want to set this up for you and frame it. I realize that uh, almost this entire show is going to include lots of places that people who don't want to hear this will be able to clip out of context and call us racist. We cannot prevent that, but I'm going to explain to you why we're approaching it this way. Any human being who is protected from consequences for his bad behavior will increase his bad behavior. This has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with sex, religion, or ethnicity. It has to do with humans. We, we here at Disaffected, we are not claiming that race, religion, or sex makes people behave badly. That's not true. What we're saying is that certain demographics have been canonized as cultural saints, and they can do no wrong. We know this phenomenon. We call it spoiled children. Children aren't born bad. They're not bad because they're children. Children increase their bad behavior when they're spoiled or abused or insulated from the consequences of their bad behavior. Normal discipline being absent spoils a child. Today in 2023, black people are at the top of the sacred caste pyramid. They can get away with anything, sometimes including assault and murder, simply because they're in that demographic category. It should be no surprise to any of us that we find black people in 2023 disproportionately behaving badly in public at the highest levels. The same thing goes for anyone claiming a transgender identity, for anyone claiming a feminist identity, a queer identity, or anyone who claims to be oppressed and is recognized in the progressive stack. But we have got to come to grips with reality. The reality is that today, in 2023, a disproportionate number of black people in America are breaking the rules of civilization, and the white people that they are victimizing are themselves punished for the abuses done to them. We have to be able to say this without flinching because it is real. It is not us here at Disaffected who are racist. We treat all human beings as full humans. Black people are fully human in every way. To be fully human means to be capable of all the good, all the bad, and all the indifferent. We are highlighting the objective, observable fact of the disproportionate amount of bad behavior in this demographic we're holding black people to the same standards of being fully human that all other humans should be held to. We are judging them on the content of their character and on the rectitude of their behavior, not on the color of their skin. But Fortune 100 companies are not doing so. You probably have not heard of this because the mainstream media is not touching it, although the mainstream media brought it up first. This is an article from Bloomberg News. You're not seeing it reflected on NBC, on CNN, in the New York Times. You would if, it were, if, if the races were reversed. But um, here's the headline. Corporate America promised to hire a lot more people of color, and it actually did. The year after Black Lives Matter protests, the S&P 100 added more than 300,000 jobs. 94 percent, 94 percent went to people of color. Now, we are in an unadmitted race war in this country. We don't like to say that, but we are in a race war. And white people are as responsible for this undisclosed race war as black people are. Moneyed white people have figured out that they can appear like holy angels of compassion by patronizing and condescending to black people and claiming to be their saviors. These corporations and activists use black people and trans people and feminists and children to get narcissistic ego gratification. It's summed up in our phrase, look at the good I do. They're not saviors. They're exploiters. I'm going to give you a quote from the Bloomberg article. Quote, for a brief moment in 2020, much of corporate America united around a common goal to address the stark racial imbalances in their workplace. Mass protests sparked by the murder of George Floyd led to a flurry of company promises, both specific and vague, to hire and promote more black people and others from underrepresented groups. Exclusive analysis by Bloomberg News shows how many of the biggest public companies did. End quote. 
Yes, they capitalize the word black. Bloomberg approves of this. They like this very, very much. They think this is a wonderful thing. <laughs> More from it. Quote, the U.S. equal opportunity, excuse me, let me start again. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission requires companies with 100 or more employees to report their workforce demographics every year. Bloomberg obtained 2020 and 2021 data for 88 S&P 100 companies and, <clears throat> and calculated overall U.S. job growth at those firms. In total, they increased their U.S. workforces by 323,094 people in 2021, the first year after the Black Lives Matter protests, and the most recent year for which this data exists. Take a look at this graphic. The overall job growth included 20,524 white workers. The other 302,570 jobs, or 94% of the headcount increase, went to people of color. Well, hooray. Next one. People of color make up a minority of the U.S. population and in most cases are underrepresented at U.S. company, big U.S. companies. In 2021, Hispanic, Asian, and black people made up a vast majority of the added workers, a trend that analysts say is necessary to overcome their historic underrepresentation. Next. The biggest shifts happened in less senior job categories. White people held fewer of these roles in 2021 than they did in 2020, whereas thousands of people of color were added to the ranks. But the trend continued up the job ladder in top high paid jobs too. Companies increased their racial diversity among executives, managers, and professionals. Now, all of this is said with an approving tone, the disproportionate, the starkly disproportionate. What does disproportionate mean? We know what it means in terms of arithmetic, percentages. But is it truly disproportionate if we factor in, I know, I know it's not allowed, I know it makes me a bad person, but if we factor in competence and merit, is it still disproportionate? Are we able to hear that without getting upset? This is blatantly illegal racism, what's going on at these com companies. This is the exact thing that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was formed to prevent. This is an exact perversion of what the EEOC allegedly is supposed to stand for. But of course, it's de facto law now. Black favoring racism is absolutely legal. In fact, it's, it's required. It's required in the everyday sense. The written law means nothing, just like the Constitution means nothing anymore. Next graphic. White people still hold a disproportionate share of the top highly paid jobs in the U.S. at S&P 100 companies, but the share of executive, managerial, and professional roles held by people of color increased by about two percentage points compared with 2020, more than double the average annual gains at big and mid-sized U.S. companies in previous, year, previous years. More from the story. Quote, Black workers who were the initial focus of the diversity push made some particularly notable gains. Their share of managers and professionals increased at 70 companies in our data set, and they boosted their ranks among executives in nearly as many firms. For years, companies have blamed the lack of a sufficient recruiting pipeline <laughs> for why their workplaces don't reflect the country's racial and ethnic makeup. White men tend to disproportionately hold the highest paying roles, and hiring managers have long said that qualified candidates from other backgrounds for elite jobs were few and far between. Couldn't possibly be because they don't exist and they're not competent. It can only mean that white people aren't working hard enough. Next graphic. Many S&P 100 companies are still mostly white, and helpfully, Bloomberg lets you look them up. They let you look up with a little pull-down menu. Who's been a bad boy? This country is mostly white. Did we forget that? You see how easy it is to be emotionally swayed by the phrase mostly white? I guarantee you that some of you listening to this right now got a little emotional jolt when I said this country was mostly white. Why? Ask yourself why. Doesn't seem so KKK when you remember that in reality, most people in this country really are white, does it? 
Last quote from here. At companies where overall employment shrank in 2021, white workers made up 68.5% of the losses. Another 16.5% were black, 9.7% were Hispanic, and 2.3% were Asians. The corporate reckoning on institutionalized racism in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder by a white police officer was a factor, too. I'll leave you this before we move on to the next one, because I know you're curious, and I'm not going to explain it because I don't need to. I don't believe that Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. Now you know what I think about that. Moving right along, let's look at some bad behavior, not at the top of the corporate ladder, but down in the public schools. You see this a lot, what we're going to show you. Um, actually, let's, let's just show them the video first, Kevin. Oh. This is a classroom. There's a black girl who's going off and screaming. And there's a white teacher. The black girl just threw a chair at the white teacher's head and knocked her out. She collapsed to the ground unconscious. Is this normal to you now? Is this normal to you that kids act this way? It's getting pretty normal. It's getting pretty common. What do you think is going to happen to this girl? in today's public schools. Will it be expulsion? No. I have a friend who's a teacher's aide in the Burlington, Vermont schools, and he says that even when kids assault teachers, like you just saw in that video, the teachers may not discipline them in any way. They, they will not get expelled. There will be no expulsion for this girl. They get sent to what, here in Burlington, they get sent to something called the wiggle room. I know it sounds like I'm making it up, but I'm not. The wiggle room, because they've got the wiggles. They gotta get the wiggles out. Yes, they do this with children who are older than five. Yes, affirmative. They have to get their excess wiggle energy out when they assault teachers. Like in 2023? Liking it very much? Expect kids to act like animals and reward them for animalistic behavior, and you get children who grow into animalistic beasts, like this girl. She is an animal. It's not her fault. You know exactly what kind of parenting she's not getting at home. You know she has no father, and you know she has a mother who screams at her that she's a bitch. And worse. And worse. How much further are we going to go? How much more of this are we as a society going to tolerate? Put aside the concerns that I don't want to hear the sympathy right now. I don't want to hear it. We're not talking about sympathy for black people right now. We've done enough of that. Let's talk about sympathy for a livable society where teachers aren't in danger of being assaulted, knocked unconscious, or killed by their students. How much more of this needs to happen before we reach equity? What is equity? Is this what we want? Now, now let's stop. Let's leave the white people aside and pretend that we don't matter and that we're all terrible. Let's have some sympathy for the black girl here. What kind of life is she going to have? You know what she's come from. You can see what she's come from and what she's turning into. Do you want to help her? If you do, you have to hold her to the standard of being fully human. And that means punishment and discipline and correction for mistakes and for aggression. If you don't, <laughs> you get what we're going to show you here coming up. So the consequences of letting children go uncorrected last a lifetime. Spoiled children, children who are raised neglectfully or who are raised in abusive households, and neglect is a form of abuse, when they're raised in parent, uh, households where the parents, if they exist at all, fight, scream, call each other motherfucker in front of the children, throw things, skillets like my mother does, these children turn into narcissistic adults at very high rates, at least emotionally dysregulated. Regulated. All of them, 100% of them with zero exceptions, are walking around with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Many of them will go on to develop borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and similar syndromes. Here's an example of how that happens. Here's one version of what this girl may grow up to be like. This is U.S. House Representative Jasmine Crockett of Texas. She's an elected official. 
young woman too. You're um, you're going to be watching a clip from the House committee hearing that took place this week on the Biden impeachment inquiry. That's right, the Joseph Biden impeachment inquiry, not Trump, Biden. Oh, you didn't know that was happening, did you? Many of you, this is the first time you've heard it. Do you wonder why you don't know? Do you wonder why you haven't heard it before? I think you should wonder. Didn't hear it on CNN, did you? That's because the media decided that you don't need to know that. It's not legitimate. You only need to know when bad orange man is going to jail. Now, before we play this, I want you to conjure up in your mind the image and the sound of a stateswoman, a real politician, a real grown-up adult politician, an intelligent, on-point elected official. Think, think of that. Bring somebody into your mind. Now, contrast that with Representative Crockett. On because he's got 91 counts pending right now. But I will tell you what the president has been guilty of. He has unfortunately been guilty of loving his child unconditionally, and that is the only evidence that they have brought forward. And honestly, I hope and pray that my parents love me half as much as he loves his child. Until they find some evidence, we need to get back to the people's work, which means keeping this government open so that people don't go hungry in the streets of the United States. And I will yield. And I will yield. She's bringing the ghetto up in the house, isn't she? Yeah, she's ghetto trash. She's talking like ghetto trash. She's head bobbing and weaving like ghetto trash. She's in a rap video. This, this is not, that's not speaking, it's verbal ejaculation. It's not meant to to be a discussion, it's meant to be an auditory assault. And then a mic drop, and I will yield. Well, right? You go, girl. This is not respectable behavior, it's trash behavior. It's the black equivalent of my people, white trash, my people from the trailer park. If they got up in the committee and start talking about getting her done, cutting a switch, I'm using the Southern accent. Of course, I don't come from the South. <laughs> I'm sorry, Southerners. <laughs> I should work on bringing back my own white trash accent from upstate New York. Um, you better believe that the white trash equivalent of what this woman did would have been instantly plastered across all major media. There would be an investigation. There would be immediate pressure. And within 24 hours, the white woman would have stepped down. You know that's true. The only, She says... But this, this behavior, this gets praised all over social media. She went, you go girl, you tell him, tell him, snap back, clap back. The only, she says the only thing that Biden and Joe Biden is guilty of is loving his child unconditionally, huh? No bribery, huh? No reason to suspect illegal foreign dealings. No reason to suspect exploitation of his office for private economic gain. No collusion with his drug-addled criminal lowlife son. No indications of frightening sexual behavior toward young girls. No, we can't see any. That's not true. Didn't happen. La, 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 la. We're all the Van Com lady from Mad TV. La, 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 la. How do you think Hunter Biden became the man that he became? It wasn't through unconditional love. <laughs> Do we like this new normal? Do you like it? Do you like it a lot? Is this what we're going to settle for in public life for the rest of our nation's eventual, perhaps, future history? This is what we're going to see in the nation's capital. These are our statesmen and stateswomen, yes? Lakeisha screaming hood nonsense at us forever? Well, why not? Why shouldn't that be? Why shouldn't that just be the way our country goes? I mean, after all, that slob and liar John Fetterman, set, uh, senator from Pennsylvania, he likes to wear his ghetto hoodie and shorts. The House Majority Leader last week uh, or the week before just axed the dress code for the entire Senate because of John Slob Fetterman. Next, we'll be de deleting the written rules of decorum. Do you think I'm joking? I'm not, and I'm not using hyperbole either. I, I'm going to go on record. I'm going to predict right now that within the next year, 
we are going to hear a story that the written rules of decorum and deportment in the House or the, or the Senate and or the Senate will be first problematized. That'll take about two days and then that document will be made inactive. There will be no more rules of decorum because speaking in turn, making salient points is white supremacy. This is the same attitude that animates people who criticized New York City's prior practice of what they called broken windows policing. The theory was that if you monitor the small things, if you've got a, an abandoned house and you fix up the windows, it's less attractive to people who want to assault the house more and tear it down more. Uh, people say, that never worked. Broken windows policing never worked. That was just an excuse for racism. No, that's wrong. It obviously worked. It is obviously true that letting the small things slide means that the next things that slide will be big things. It's not a myth. It's real. We're living in it. Come back after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. Washington National Cathedral in DC has a history of switching out their stained glass windows to reflect very current political upheavals, at least, at least since the 20th century. In 1953, the cathedral installed a set of stained glass windows featuring Confederate generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Apparently, this, is, this has been characterized as, uh, it was supposed to be part of a gesture of reconciliation between the North and the South. I don't know much more about the history. Uh, I don't know that I'd say it was a good idea or a bad idea. I, I'm leaning, I, I, well, I mean, what do I have to say about these things? I'm not, I'm not a churchgoer, right? But I, I think, even from my non-believer's perspective, it's probably not healthy for a church to be that au courant, it's probably a better idea for stained glass to depict long ago historical events that are probably biblically associated, but that's not what we do in America. So, <laughs> so in 1953, <coughs> excuse me, in 1953, they put in these um, stained glass windows with Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Well, they've replaced them again recently. They've removed those and they've replaced them with these. Do we have, yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'll describe these to you. They're, they're stained glass windows um, in the, the original um, uh, Gothic uh, arches, beautiful architecture, uh, beautiful window frames, but they are, they're George Floyd protests. They don't say George Floyd, but that's what they are. That's what they look like. You can see from the clothing people are wearing, this is very 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, and they, they, street protests so the people are carrying signs and the signs say fairness no 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 foul play very um very aggressive and it is also done in the cheap and degraded alleged art style that you may know as corporate memphis it's basically facebook in stained glass People's um, limbs are exaggerated. They have no facial features. The proportions are weird and odd. You know. <laughs> no foul play. 
Is this progress? What do you think? All right. I want to introduce you to a woman who was named Pava Marie LaPere. Here she is. 26-year-old um, CEO of a software company, and in this picture, she's wearing um, a T-shirt that says Equitable Accessible Ecosystems. <clears throat> As I said, she was 26, CEO of a software company, and she's described herself as an anti-racist who was against, quote, the criminaliz criminalization of black bodies. Now she's dead. I'm going to quote to you from a news article from the site Information Liberation. Quote, EcoMap Technologies CEO Pava Marie LaPere, a self-described anti-racist and Black Lives Matter supporter, who spoke out against, quote, the criminalization of black bodies, end quote, was allegedly beaten to death in her home in Baltimore on Monday by a black male who was released early from prison under the criminal justice reform policy she championed. And I only learned about that this morning. I wrote this script yesterday, so I'm, I'm winging it here a little bit. Uh, this is not confirmed, but I've seen it in a couple of different sources. It appears, based on what I've seen in media this morning, he not only broke in and killed her, he raped her repeatedly, and then he set her body on fire. And I believe he may also have tried to set her boyfriend on fire. Again, I cannot confirm these things, but um, it, it, it would be absolutely no surprise to me if those details were withheld until somebody forced them out. Now, this that I'm going to quote to you comes from USA Today. Quote, a murder suspect labeled, no, yeah, sorry, Kevin, <laughs> I'm just reading this. A murder suspect labeled by police as willing to, quote, do anything he can to cause harm, end quote, is the target of an all-out search after a 26-year-old software development company founder was found slain at her Baltimore apartment. Baltimore police said Pava Marie LaPere was found at 11.30 a.m. after someone called for help. She died from blunt force trauma. Authorities announced an arrest warrant at a news conference Tuesday afternoon for James, excuse me, Jason Dean Billingsley, 32. He is charged with first degree murder in LaPere's killing. Officials said Billingsley is believed to be armed and extremely dangerous. Here's a quote from uh, Com uh, Baltimore Police Commissioner Richard Worley, quote, we implore residents to be aware of your surroundings at all times, end quote. Acting Police Commissioner Richard Worley said at a news conference, and here's the next quote. This is the graphic we've got for you. This individual will kill and he will rape. He will do anything he can to cause harm, end quote. It's Commissioner Worley. Now we have a picture for you of Jason Dean Billingsley. Two pictures, actually. His first mugshot that we have from 2011, his current uh, most current mugshot from when he was in jail that he was sprung from early, I'm sure, for a very, very good reason. Look at this man. I know they're mugshots. You know, I try to be careful about... I, I'm not a fan of, of people who style themselves as body language experts. Um, it, it's often not clear exactly what their expertise is. Uh, what their methodology is. I'm not sure that, quote, body language expert is a recognized academic or forensic specialty. Yes, there are people who are better and worse at picking up um, hints from body language. Body language does tell us things. But this whole formalized idea that we can tell how many times somebody blinks with the left eye and the right eye, where their eyes go and all this stuff, I'm not convinced that that's real. So I try to remind myself when I see mug shots like this, that this is a mug shot. This is a person who's caught at the, you know, on one of the worst days of his or her life in, in an adversary and confrontational situation, they're going to be wearing probably an angry or confrontational look. Nonetheless, look at this guy. Those are the slitted snake eyes of a psychopath. I don't have any trouble saying that and feeling confident about that opinion. It's a very common expression on black male criminals. Yes, specifically black male criminals. They, they put their head back like this, and they 
I don't even have to open my eyes. I don't care about you that much. That's that you get that a lot. Do we like this new normal? We should keep getting rid of bail, right? No cash bail anymore. It's oppressive. It oppresses black people, especially. Well, white women, white progressive women, anti-racist white women, keep going. Keep sowing the seeds and then reap the harvest of the seeds that you've sown. Enjoy the consequences. Here's somebody who does enjoy the consequences from Seattle, naturally. You know, I keep asking whether we like this new normal, this newly degraded and degenerate culture. Some do. Some like it very, very much. They like it the way pigs like a mud wallow. They like to get down in it and grind right in the muck and giggle while they're doing it. They get right down in it and grind and make happy pig noises. Here's a progressive white woman who absolutely loves living in shit, literal human shit. Seattle decriminalized drug use, and then they criminalized it again. Oh my God, who are you getting these facts from? You're from New York, apparently you're listening to the wrong people. I saw people shooting up on my way down here. Oh, did you? Okay. And they were bothering you? I was in a car, but you know, people- Oh oh, no, you're in a car. Oh no, they were hurting you so bad, oh no. (laughs) <laughs> oh no, were they hurting you? Oh my god, you were in a car. Oh, do you, were they bothering you? Were they bothering you? You like it, Karen? You do. You like it a lot. Gets you off, doesn't it? You like that. You got to make fun of the stupid, privileged white man, like you're not privileged and white yourself. You're certainly not starving, are you? What does this look like to you, audience? How do you explain that behavior? How would you explain it? Tell me in the comments, please. I'd like to hear your point of view. Here's how I explain it. People like this are so religiously enraptured with their woke vision that they will actively put themselves and their neighborhoods and the people who live in them, including the children, in danger. They consciously choose this, and they say that they like it. She does like it. You can see that she likes it. She gets more pleasure, more personal satisfaction out of taunting normal people than she experiences pain in watching her streets become unsafe for women and children and men. But, I mean, as you can tell from this woman, uh, she's absolutely somebody who uh, has a bumper sticker that says, well-behaved women rarely make history. She's probably got a bumper sticker that says, my other car is a broomstick. She's absolutely a woke feminist. We know this. She's practically wearing the uniform. Look at the glasses, for God's sake. She likes it that much. She gets pleasure out of this. That's how powerful this cult is. Um, My friend Christopher Aaron Felker, who's the chairman of the uh, Burlington Republican Party, put up a video on social media this week of downtown Burlington. It looked literally like San Francisco looks today. Filthy tents, shit-stained clothes, actual shit on the ground, human shit, trash all over the grass in the park. In that video, he counted 60 hypodermic needles in what was, just a few months ago, a well-kept, well-manicured, tidy residential neighborhood. That's gone now. Are we loving it yet? Well, a couple of young babies believe that they're going to be absolutely loving it here in Vermont. You know, we, we, we've talked about a couple of the bills that have, uh, have made their way through the Vermont legislature that make Vermont a so-called trans sanctuary state. Um, they ref- uh, these laws are legally protecting parents who uh, surgically mutilate their children in custody cases. They're saying Vermont courts will not obey extradition orders from other legally constituted courts and state in violation of the United States Constitution. Uh, they have made what they call accessing gender affirming care an articulated state uh, right, citizen's right in the state. It's written out in law. This is a right that you get to have this in Vermont. And we predicted that this would, obviously, I mean, it's, you don't have to be the amazing Kreskin to foresee this, that this was going to attract people to come to the sanctuary state of Vermont. And it is. Um, so this segment is called Escape to Trans Mountain. <laughs> um, 
I want you to meet a couple of people here. They are called Claude and Jones. They were given pseudonyms by the UK's uh, tabloid newspaper, The Mirror, to, quote, protect them. Of course, while The Mirror also runs their full faces and their photographs. Here they are, courtesy of The Mirror. Oh, is that, um, is that the trans joy that we hear so much about? That looks like it might be trans joy. For those of you just listening, we're looking at a couple of kids that are probably between 19 and 21 years old with stupid hair. Uh, stupid top knot hair on the boy, uh, stupid Slimer puke green frosted tips on the girl, pierced eyebrows, and they've they've got their eyes closed and they're they're just laughing like oh I just love it it's so good I have a tree and joy. So disgusting. Um, Kevin, this is not a graphic. I'm merely reading from my script, but this is from the mirror. A disabled trans non-binary couple has been raising $4,000 to escape Utah after it became, quote, an extremely unsafe environment for them, one of their relatives has said. Claude and jo I, just, I, want, I, keep, I want to do it French. Claude, Claude and Jones. Pseudonyms used to protect their identities have been together since 2020. But in recent months, they've been experiencing problems with their own families as well as the larger community where they do not feel accepted. Claude, 21, is white, and Jones, 19, is first-generation Indian American. They both identify as trans slash non-binary and have multiple disabilities. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> Problems and disabilities. Continuing in the story, according to the GoFundMe page created for the couple, Claude's parents have been more supportive, more supportive than most parents of LGBTQIA plus youth in Utah. But Jones has experienced, quote, escalating physical, emotional and financial abuse from their parent. I have, to, I have to stop and break into the quote here. This is gonna be grammatically awkward. There's no way that I can help you on that, except to tell you that yes, the mirror decided to use their pronouns. So it is, it is difficult, sometimes impossible to parse the language to know whether um, uh, the reporter is speaking about one of these two individuals or both of these individuals or another collective plural that might be referred to as they. So you'll just have to suffer through it the way I am. And yes, of course, it's just a boy and a girl, obviously. You can see it in their pictures. <laughs> their pictures behind their pseudonyms to protect their identity. Um, okay, back to back to the to the text. Uh, so Claude's experienced the um, physical, emotional, and financial abuse from their parent, as well as, quote, forced estrangement from their extended family and DESI community, D-E-S-I. This is a word used, um, I believe, to describe uh, people of Indian heritage. India, India, not American Indian. I have noticed that uh, DESI has become a fetish word for the woke over the past year or so, too. It's the newest multicultural culture. Uh, that people are saying, this is my heritage. I have always felt that I belonged here. It's just the new fetish. This kid, he's not even full Indian. You can tell looking at him, maybe he's got one Indian parent, obviously. First generation Indian American, give me a break. You're just a dumb American kid. Back to the article. This has encouraged the couple to decide to relocate to Vermont where the LGBTQIA plus communities are more close knit and support each other, the fundraiser says. Well, they has a lot of problems, don't them? Financial abuse from their parent? Like not paying for all the stuff they demand or just what? Here's, here's a quote. This is for you, Kevin. Here you go. Number 14. Growing up, Claude experienced a series of physical and mental health concerns, including chronic fatigue, food and chemical allergies, autism spectrum disorder, Ehlers-Danlos -Dan disease, and gastroparesis. <laughs> they were able to access medical care through their father's insurance, but experienced, quote, serious ableism and judgment, end quote, from their parents who did not understand their illnesses. Okay. Maybe because their illnesses are made up. I bet they have Morgellons disease, too. 
Now I'm gonna meet these kids halfway. For these kids to turn out this way, it is in fact highly likely that their parents were neglectful and or abusive. That is likely. I believe on balance that they probably were severely mistreated in their family growing up. So they're right, but probably for the wrong reasons. Normal families don't turn out kids this screwed up that often. But like most young people these days, they've created fantasy identities, fantasy ethnic heritages, fantasy commitments to fantasy versions of religions that they have nothing to do with and no connection to. Next quote. Jones was raised by a white father and an Indian American mother. What did I tell you? Half but was not involved with the Desi community until recently, when they recently started attending temple, volunteering, playing Hindu music, and participating in cultural and religious rituals. Jones also had a series of conditions, including chronic bone and muscle pain and ADHD. And they think they're coming to the land of Oz in Vermont. Last quote here. Two final reasons why Claude and Jones are planning to relocate to Vermont. The strong and close LGBTQIA plus and AAPI, that's Asian American Pacific Islander, a category that doesn't exist, and AAPI slash Desi communities. The Desi community in Utah is extremely conservative, making it uncomfortable slash unsafe for Jones to participate in their cultural and religious traditions or to build relationships and connections with others who could understand and relate to their experiences as a first-generation Indian American, end quote. What a bunch of bullshit. Sadly, these kids are right. They will be welcomed, feted, showered with money, and treated as moral exemplars. They'll demand cash and housing and social deference, and they will get it from the state of Vermont. They're going right to Burlington, I guarantee it. Mark my words. Thank God I moved out of this city and its suburban environments last week. Okay, we're going to another break, but we would love to have your support. Do you get value out of Disaffected? I hope so. We try to bring you something you're not gonna get somewhere else, but it costs money to do this, and we, we need your help and support, and we'd be really glad to have it. There's a couple of ways that are really easy to do it. Best door in is just go to our Substack, disaffectedpod.substack.com, or if you don't like that, you can also go over to the platform Subscribestar, subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Uh, those who uh, pledge and donate to us every month get invited to our private members-only Discord, where sometimes you can hear backstage recordings of shows, special guests. Um, I pop in from time to time and say hi. Uh, so again, disaffectedpod.substack.com or subscribestar.com slash disaffected. And we'll see you to close out the show. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform. So make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more, and all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. Before we get to more content, I'm going to shill for myself. Do you need somebody to talk to? Do you need somebody to talk to who understands high conflict people, personality disordered people at work, at home, at church? Check out my consulting site, joshuaslocum.net. I've got calendar time opening up this month in October, and you can book an hour long session with me and we can talk about absolutely anything you want. Obviously, I focus on family difficulties, trauma difficulties, but we can talk about your career. Uh, but you can tap my extensive and very strange niche knowledge on funeral planning and how to bury somebody on a budget. It's all good. So check out joshuaslocum.net. 
Now, in news of what could never happen and that you are crazy, I'm playing around with my buttons here. <laughs> Let me start again. In news of things that could never happen and that you're crazy to think could happen and things that you shouldn't even be allowed to think or say, we present to you from the magazine, The Spectator. Headline, scientists shocked and alarmed at what's in the mRNA shots. That's mRNA shots, the COVID alleged vaccines. Um, not an element, Kevin, I'm reading from my script. Early in 2023, Genomic scientist Kevin McKernan made an accidental discovery. While running an experiment in his Boston lab, McKernan used some vials of mRNA, Pfizer, and Moderna COVID vaccines as controls. He was, quote, shocked to find that they were allegedly contaminated with tiny fragments of plasmid DNA. McKernan, who has 25 years experience in his field, ran the experiment again, confirming that the vials contained up to, in his opinion, 18 to 70 times more DNA contamination than the legal limits allowed by the European Medicines Agency and the Food and Drug Administration. In particular, McKernan was alarmed to find the presence of an SV40 promoter in the Pfizer vaccine vials. This is a sequence that is, quote, used to drive DNA into the nucleus, especially in gene therapies, end quote. McKernan explains, this is something that regulatory agencies around the world would have specifically said is not possible with the mRNA vaccines. Not possible. Couldn't happen. You're crazy to even think that it might happen in any possible world. Here's another quote. <clears throat> It's number 15, Kevin. In September of this year, Dr. Buckhouse shared his findings in, South Car in a South Carolina Senate hearing. Quote, I'm kind of alarmed about this DNA being in the vaccine. It's different from RNA because it can be permanent, he told those present. Continuing, quote, there is a very real hazard, he said, that the contaminant DNA fragments will integrate with a person's genome and become a permanent fixture of the cell, leading to autoimmune problems and cancers in some people who have had the vaccinations. He also noted that these genome changes can, quote, last for generations, end quote. Not possible. Couldn't happen. You're insane to think that that could happen. It's dangerous for you to be allowed to speculate that it might happen. You shouldn't be allowed to think this either. That's what we've heard for three years now, more than three years. Dangerous for you to think that. How dare you? Are you stupid? Are you crazy? Are you a conspiracy theorist? Conspiracies don't happen. You're just a conspiracy theorist. Hmm. So what do we have here? This is not dispositive, of course. This is one man's opinion. It's one set of experiments. I can't tell you that it's absolutely accurate. Does my gut tell me it's probably more likely than, than not to be true? Absolutely it does. Why? Because it goes against the narrative. And the narrative has been a lie. We know it's a lie. We also know, to some degree, from observation, how many rock stars are falling over dead of heart attacks in the middle of their sets? And don't tell me it's because they're all old. There have always been old rock stars. Always. There haven't always been as many who are keeling over in concert. That's new. That is a new and novel observation that's happening in the three-dimensional physical world, not in someone's imagination. How many people are popping up in your life who have cancer all of a sudden out of nowhere. Sure, yes, it happens. Heart attacks out of nowhere all of a sudden. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm an outlier. I had a heart attack at 36 years old. There's a lot more outliers lately, aren't there? Yeah. You know what? You know what I have to say to the medical establishment, the vaccine makers and the public policy makers? Get fucked. Not one more vaccine in my body ever under any circumstances. No, not even a tetanus shot. I retract what I said about a year ago on the show. I will not even take a tetanus shot and I won't let any vaccines into the bodies of anybody I care about to the degree that I can influence them. That's it.
Now, in news of sex is not real, <laughs> other things that are crazy and not real, like biological sex, this, this clip, you're going to love this clip. This is from GB News in Great Britain. Uh, roll it, Kevin. Why would you vote for someone that is deluded? If they're deluded about biological facts, what else are they deluded about? I, I think you're intentionally merging bio, biology with gender. Um, I think it's... I think it's really dehumanizing. I think it's embarrassing. I think this whole list is pathetic. Um, and I don't see any, I see the only shamefulness for me would be not to be on the list. Uh, what would you answer if asked what is a woman? I, I, the law, whatever. I, Why do you have to fall back on the law? What, what's that, what's Why don't you look in the mirror? But you think if a trans woman looks in the mirror, I don't understand what you're trying to. Well, you're an adult female. Human. You, yeah, so you're so going to presume you are a woman. you're going to presume my genitalia. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm going to presume that you're a biological female. Okay. Yeah, first of fine. all, you've, you've mothered a child. Right. So, and then you're so here, I, you're am here I to have. I reduced to that then? Well, so, to be a woman, to. you have to be able to bear well, children? You're only, you're only reduced, reduced in a, that's in that's a sense. Right. That a doctor, when you come out of your mother's womb, the doctor declares your sex at that plenty point. You're not women, reduced to anything. Plenty of women don't have a womb. Are they not women? They're still biological women. They I think are, if yes. you reduce someone to because a sum of their, every, a sum of their body in, parts me, is let me really sad. Let me interrupt you. Every cell in their body contains DNA that confirms them as female. Those. Have you checked yours? Well, you can. Well, are you questioning the science well, you now? Well, you can. I don't think your biology is how we live. I think your gender is how... Your biology is, is a fact. So? So what? If, 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 a, if a woman says she's a woman and that's how she lives her life, why would you not respect that? Because we know from recent experience that men claiming to be women are now applying after being rapists to go into female jails. So whether a woman has a penis or not is, a, is not a frivolous question. It's extremely serious for our spaces, for female wards so in hospitals, for female prisons. These people are dangerous. You know, it's it's really good to hear and see a woman putting that silly cow in her place. Um, hats off. More women, please speak up like this. And I know this is this is one thing I will give uh, to some of you feminists who are who are listening. It is true. I know this because I've watched you. You have been saying this as women, as feminists for years and you haven't been listened to and you have been mocked. That is absolutely true. I have no truck with feminism. I don't respect it as a philosophy. I think it's misguided. But there are people I know who believe in some of its tenets who I, I know are intelligent people who mean well. So, no, I don't agree with you on the feminism, but I do recognize what you've done as women and feminists uh, to try to bring this to public attention. And, you, and you've been scorned for it. That's absolutely true. Um, but it's nice to see mainstream women doing it now, too. This is just how it happens. You know, feminists... It, um, I. Actually, I can empathize with you, believe it or not. I really can, and I do. I know what it feels like to be somebody who has been raising his voice and pointing out the obvious and, and, and pulling the mask off and telling people that the emperor has no clothes and having very few people listen to me. I know what it's like to be mocked for that. I know what it's like to be called an extremist. Um, um, is, is, is a matter of fact, um, it still happens, I'm sorry to say, feminists, with your crowd. Um, your crowd still pulls this shit with me um, whenever they don't agree with the fact that I point out that women are largely socially responsible for normalizing trans. I know what it's like. I also know what it's like to be saying this in detail for years and to have other people all of a sudden just discover it. I understand. But, you know, this woman... I, I, I couldn't even catch her name. Whoever this guest was on here. Madam, it's you who is shameful and pathetic and embarrassing. You. You look like a silly little girl. You sound like an idiot. It's you who's talking absolute cobblers. Not the male guest. Not the male host. Not the female host. Not the other people with the bemused looks on their faces. It's you who's talking bloody nonsense. And you know what, Sweeney? You better update your programming real soon because you're starting to sound a little 2021 and this stuff is going out of fashion real quick. Okay? Get ahead of it. Now, 
here's something that the, uh, the pro-female and feminist contingent might actually like. <laughs> We're going to look at a male psychosexual deviant, in my opinion. Um, the kind of psychosexual deviant lunatic that this woman on GB News is supporting and making good room for and making sure there's a space at the table. Space at the table. What you going to bring to the table? Cock and balls. And I hope that she likes it, this woman on GB News. I hope she likes this, what she's made space for, because it's going to come to her house, too. You ready? Get the tea ready. All right, let's, let's roll this. Uh, I think it's an Instagram or a TikTok clip. Let's break down what transphobia is, because a lot of people seem to think that transphobia is just the idea of being afraid of trans people. A phobia can also be an aversion to something. So if you don't want to be around, like, date or whatever trans people solely because they are this trans, is a man, by the you way, have an listeners. aversion to them being trans, which is a phobia. To be transphobic no, doesn't not. mean that you have to be hateful, aggressive in any way. It just means that you are averting yourself from those people. So the next time you may sit there and say to yourself, I'm not transphobic. I just don't think trans people exist. I'll be nice to trans people. I just don't believe in their cause. I'm not going to bully someone who is trans, but I'm also not going to promote their cause. These are all different ways to have an aversion to someone who is trans without directly being mean or aggressive towards them. You could be the nicest person on the planet who does nothing to harm anybody around you and still be transphobic. And it's your job to dive deep into your psyche and find out why you have that aversion in the first place. Where is it rooted? Simple as that. Simple as that. And if you don't dive deep into your psyche, he's going to dive into it deep for you. He's going to make sure somebody dives deep and penetrates your psyche. For your own good. You may not have boundaries. You may not have preferences. You may not choose whom you associate with. You may not say no to sleeping with a man like him without being abusive. You having boundaries and you making choices is an act of abuse. You're hurting me by saying no. You might be the nicest person in the world. You might treat me really well Never raise your voice, never call me names, never exclude me from the lunch gathering. But you're still an abuser. Because in your mind, you don't believe in the reality of my narcissistic mask. I don't just want you to treat me outwardly the way I want to be treated. I want you to bear your soul. Let me look at it. Let me finger it. Let me manipulate it. Let me put myself inside you in your mind. You see me the way I see me, or I'm going to destroy you. That is narcissism. That is cluster B. That is your abusive husband. It is my abusive mother. It is your abusive president. It's every wokey. It's sick. It's satanic. Come on, just the tip. We're going to close this show out with, and I, I couldn't write better than this. I was going to write something, we we'll call it a closer, you know, kind of a summation, an outgoing monologue, if you will. I couldn't do better than what this woman wrote that I saw on Twitter. I couldn't believe I saw it on Twitter because uh, apparently in my long extended absence from Twitter, which I, I broke, I fell off the wagon this week, but then I logged out again. Uh, apparently, if you pay enough money, you can write essay length stuff on Twitter. So that's what I found. This is, uh, what, it's not a tweet, it's an essay. It's a short essay from a user named C Bucks Rules. You see it here on your screen. Um, that's just um, the first couple of paragraphs. I'm going to read the whole thing to you. Full text here. I'm having a strange experience. Up until the last few years, and more so recently, I was a rather all-around likable person. 
This is a woman, by the way. I'm sorry to break in, but this is important. It's important to note her sex here. Back to it. I wasn't confrontational. I didn't interrupt people. I paused and listened when I was interrupted. I always found a way to turn a negative into a positive. I made myself small and made myself the butt of jokes to make others seem bigger. If I didn't like you, I'd still make polite conversation and show empathy or sympathy. I'd understand and make allowances for other people's struggles, even when I had and have my own. I've shown kindness to strangers and people I called, quote, friends, at a heavy sacrifice to myself. I found the best ways to express myself and my emotions without rocking the boat. I was patient. I put everyone first. I made everyone feel comfortable at the expense of my comfort. I constantly apologized to the point where I drove people insane. I also thought if I didn't ask, I would still get, because I was practicing the hallmarks of what I thought being a good person was. What did this get me? Did this get me great friends or relationships, romantic or otherwise? Did this get me closer to my life goals? Dear readers, it did not. Whatever I gave wasn't actually returned like I was told that it would. It got me into a state of being taken advantage of. It got me into a state of being without and constantly having to rebuild. It got me into a state of being stationary while watching the world move on without me. The changes I'm experiencing have not come overnight at all. I'm just becoming better at not caring, not being patient, not being empathetic on certain subjects. No, I don't have spare change. No, I won't be donating to this charity. I'm getting better at asking for what I want. And more importantly, refusing what I don't want. And also, I come first every single time. Is whatever I'm putting my energy into going to bring me joy? No, then I'm not doing it. Not sorry. I say what I want and how I feel and I will tell you what I think about you to your face. Never have I told so many people to go fuck themselves online or in person as much as I have this year alone and never have I progressed with my life as quickly as I have in that same amount of time. I apologize far less. I now display behavioral traits that people deem unkind, unvirtuous, and bad. You might be thinking that I might be writing my own v villain origin arc. And to be honest, if being a villain is having the courage to set and maintain boundaries, achieve your goals, and be the happiest you've ever been, and as a byproduct, all you get is strangers online or in real life shake their finger at you and huff and puff at you, then I'm here for it. But I'm not yet. What I'm starting to understand is that life isn't about good versus bad. It's about the healthy balance of the two. Do not twist this perception into some fucked up extreme, please. I know how people get on this application all too well. I'm starting to understand that to be happy, I must sometimes, or a lot of the time, be a dick. And I've been learning not to feel bad or apologize for this. I have always looked after my closest. I'm just not doing it for anyone else, that's all. You may agree with this or you may not, and that's okay. It's my life and I want to live it for me instead of for others. I'll see where this takes me, but it's working for me right now. So why stop? Never stop. Good night.